Bloop a doop a doo. Bloop a doop a da ba boo. Hello, fabulous interlocutors of the internet, fabulous denizens of DOS interwebs. Welcome back to our 90s series and our review of music from 92. Hi, I'm Michael. I'm Molly. I'm Ramin. I'm Erica. One important event that I wanted to talk about first, Dvorak arrived in the U.S. to be the artistic director of the National Conservatory of Music. And this led to the New World Symphony in 93. Classic. Yeah. I studied them when I was in school, but um, the only one that I remember is the very first one of this set, which is the really pretty... It's got this really pretty pedal tone in the right hand of the piano the whole time. It's, it's a nice Brahms thing. does really pretty. Yeah. Brahms also, when he was younger, was really pretty. Super hot. I could see what Clara saw in him. I recently listened to this and I found that the moments when it feels especially reverent are the exciting moments and everything else is just like, this is Beethoven again. I haven't listened to this and if I have, it's been a long time, but my general feelings about Bruckner have always been that he feels as grandiose as Wagner, but not as interesting. To me, it's always like, mom, can we get this Beethoven? Oh, we have Beethoven at home and it's Bruckner. The bigger side of Beethoven is sort of Bruckner. Orchestra musicians love to play Bruckner, but I don't know that necessarily anybody is that excited to listen to Bruckner. <laughs> And singers really aren't excited to sing Bruckner. Every piece I've ever sung of Bruckner's, even when it's short, is like exhausting. Oh, wait, but I remember there's the one that we always do in the church choir. Oh, Siusti? Yeah. And Locus Siusti? No, I'm, I, yeah, I'm going to disagree oh, just a little bit on the, the Bruckner. Choral works are really, really special when you get the right ensemble to sing them because they're a cappella and they're not easy. But I did always notice about his symphonic works that it almost felt like someone completely different and his symphonic works also felt like you know like you said he was a little too beethoven-y and it was like he was trying to do what others had done really well which is fine and it's laudable but it's not he wasn't very revolutionary in that space and then the, the choral music i wouldn't say he was revolutionary but he did write some satisfying pieces the things that bruckner is known for even in his instrumental works are when it's especially religious mm -hmm. feeling and reverent that stuff clicks but mm -hmm. um, everything else is just like, yeah, it's it's good. And nothing that really excites me. Yeah. And to be clear, I'm not um, suggesting that his vocal music wasn't good. Um, I definitely like listening to the Locus Iste or other works. I just don't really like singing them because he kind of is one of those instrumentalists who conceives of voices the way instruments are. Singing his music as a vocalist, it sort of feels like my voice is trying to be an organ, mm -hmm. like not a lot of places to breathe, really, really sustained, and not always the most comfortable spots of my voice. Yeah. Especially as a bass, you would feel that way because there's quite a bit of pedal tone you all have to do. And that's the same problem with Beethoven. Beethoven, Beethoven was obsessed with writing good vocal music. He was terrible at it. And he never really got there. A lot of his instrumental yeah. music is titled, has like subsections of like aria and stuff like that. Yeah. And he was so jealous of Rossini. Who wasn't? Well, because Rossini was retired at 40. Yeah, Rossini <laughs> was, was rich. He knew what the public liked and just fed it. <laughs> he, he wrote, just raked in the cash. He wrote the same opera a dozen <laughs> times. <laughs> And not to go too far back into our uh, 80s and 70s and 60s and 50s and 40s reviews that we've done already, but I feel similarly comparing Beethoven to Rossini in that, like, I really like listening to Beethoven, not singing it, and I feel the opposite about Rossini. I really like singing Rossini, but I don't really enjoy sitting through the operas. Yep. 100% agree. Gustav Mahler, Das Himmlische Leben, which is German for the Himmlische Leben. <laughs> <laughs> That's what is the Mahler 2. Four. Four is based on. Yeah. yeah. It's a piece for voice and piano. I actually don't really love it as a piece of vocal music for know. voice and piano. I think it's much more interesting in the orchestrated version. Yeah, yeah. I agree with that. I have sung it. I'm not, no, I haven't performed it, but I've, I've learned it. And you really dig your fingers into a piece of music. And there's a lot going on in the text. Like if you can really connect with the text, like this image of like this heavenly, peaceful, utopian sort of place where like you're just chilling with the saints, yo. <laughs> and the sort of pastoral 
music is I think very evocative that like that that pastoral sort of bouncy music gives way to this broad worshipful sound yeah it's beautiful you said evocative I haven't listened to the piece myself but I do think touching on something you said that Mahler is one of those composers who really rewards doing lots of research and yeah really diving deep into like text and harmonic analysis and all those things in a way that I think many other composers in this century aren't. Not all, certainly like Beethoven, Wagner, some of the ones we've named are similar, but I think Mahler, there's just so much depth of meaning in his work, even when it's not enjoyable to listen to, it's enjoyable to learn about. For me, Das Himmelische Leben as a voice and piano piece is, it's fine, but then if you compare it to Das Knappen Wunderhorn mm -hmm. or Kinder Toten Lieder, it's, those pieces are so good. And it's yeah. like, this is, this is fine. But in the Fourth Symphony, it is much, much better. It's sort of like what we said in our last video about Tori Amos's album, even the tracks that aren't that great to us are still great because it's a Tori album. Them. Same yeah. thing is true of uh, her contemporary Mahler. And this is actually really interesting because it is a symphony, but it has a full chorus and a baritone and soprano solo. They're basically, they have opera scenes in the middle of this symphony. Full retrospective back and forth. I don't know it. I don't, I didn't before I listened to it either. And it's, it's interesting. I don't love it, but it's interesting. This is, you know, once going back again to Beethoven, once Beethoven added a chorus to his symphonies, know, then, everybody, then yeah. like everyone's like, what can I add to mine? And, you know, Mahler adding yeah, Mahler solos. Like, you get yeah. as many musicians as I can possibly fit on one stage. Yeah. The Claire for Symphony is interesting and it, it's for big voices, so it's fun to listen to big voices. So. Uh, should I sing it? Or you should at least listen to it. One of the things I love about this era is composers and musicians really combining genres and styles and giving new meaning to old forms like what Mahler did with symphonies what Sibelius did with works like this what A Tribe Called Quest did with their um album we talked about in the last video you know it's pretty cool which is Italian for the Wally. No, this opera is like one of the classic sort of like outrageous Verismo operas because okay so if you're not familiar with the Verismo genre Verismo is Italian for realism. So the idea was like to create these like slice of life operas that depicted the lives of real people as opposed to like a lot of operas that came before that were about noblemen and, and all of this. But the reality of it is that it was just like the most campy melodrama <laughs> you could possibly <laughs> imagine. And La Wally is one of the great operas that ends with a soprano singing a majestic sweeping aria before she gets crushed by an avalanche. <laughs> Does it take place in the Alps somewhere? It takes place in, in the Alps. Yeah, like Switzerland or something, or maybe the Italian Alps. It's one of those operas that is not really staged very often, but people know the aria because it gets used in movies and stuff because it's very dramatic and evocative. And fascinatingly, that term verismo in this era seems to always come with a sense of drama, like what we talked about with the TV series, The Verismo World. On MTV. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a beautiful short opera about a young blind woman. I don't know it super well. I've seen it once. It does the Tchaikovsky thing, right? Which is like Tchaikovsky's the best French composer. <laughs> it's lush and beautiful. I don't find Tchaikovsky's vocal music to be interesting. Well, that's the thing. I think that Tchaikovsky uses vocal line in a way that it's like, the vocal lines are there to express the text, but it's really the orchestra that does all of the emotional sort of work. I tend to think of Tchaikovsky, when I first start to think of him as kind of the Mendelssohn of Russian music, like one of those composers who was looking back more than looking forward. Really Tchaikovsky is looking west more than he's looking back. E Pagliacci, which is Italian for the Pagliacci. Another great Verismo opera. Another ridiculous, campy plot point. This is sad murder clowns. <laughs> if you're watching this and you're not an opera person, um, you know the main aria that is beloved from this opera. It's like the sad clown sort of thing. It, uh, what does he say? He's like, does he say laugh clown, laugh, or cry Something clown, like cry, or whatever? And he sings that before he goes on to murder his wife <laughs> on stage in front of an audience. I'm pretty sure it's laugh, crown, laugh to keep from crying is like he finishes yeah. the sentence as the aria goes on. I do love this opera. There are parts of it I love more than others. 
others. But what I love about it is how compact it is. Like it feels yes. like there isn't a moment that happens that doesn't need to happen. It's one of maybe a handful of operas that I can sit through and stay engaged with evenly the whole show. Underrated aria from this opera, uh, uh, Sudono La Su, that has mm -hmm. that like little sort of- the bird song thing. Yeah, yeah. The, well, and also like that almost music box, waltzy kind of thing. Evan, 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 Evan. What's her name? What's the soprano's name? The character you mean? Yeah. Uh, Columbia? That's her, um, that's not her, her, her character's name. It's it's the character she plays who's Columbia. Yeah, because that's, that's the, uh, well, also Pagliacci. Yeah, but it's also Pagliacci. So yeah. they're all named for the, um, the, it's uh, Nedda. Nedda. Oh, Nedda, that's right. Uh, they're all the Comedia characters, yeah. yeah. But we're talking about Pagliacci. It makes you think of also Capillaria Rusticana, which I actually prefer. And I feel like I'm the only person who prefers that. It's no, I do too. Well, Erica, you have a role in it. And it's a quite epic role, but that's it's, for it's another really another episode. But mm -hmm. I think Santuzza is a character who is easier to relate to than Nedda. That's part of why I like Cavalleria more than Pagliacci. I also think that um, Cavalleria achieves the goals of Verismo sort of more authentically than some of these campier pieces. Like, it feels more like a genuine slice of life than, like, an absurd melodrama. Whenever we're saying anything is campy, that is never a knock on it yeah camp is great camp is necessary <laughs> that's what i love about verismo the absurdity of it it's opera right like you can't take it too seriously mm -hmm. right and i think that's what makes it fun yeah. well and also camp doesn't have to necessarily mean that it never makes you feel things when i say things i mean things besides laughter or whatever it doesn't have to always be something you're deriding this makes me think of one of the best theater lessons i ever received when i was in into the woods in high school we were talking about the scene where the baker's wife is crushed by the giant and the four remaining living main characters are coming together figuring out what they're going to do so it's, it's like intense scene everyone's really emotionally upset and the birds show up and talk to cinderella and fly away and then little red goes you can talk to birds <laughs> the other people in the cast and i were upset we we're like talking to the director is like why is this really funny line in this really intense scene and she's like no the switch of emotion back and forth makes each emotion stronger that's what i've always said about dear rosen cavalier right like the absurd comedy of dear rosen cavalier makes the sort of heartache at the end feel that much more intense sublime yeah. yeah speaking of heartache the next opera is full of it even though it's not 92 we were just talking about a, an easter opera but now we've got a christmas opera the Christmas opera. Another one with a great mezzo role, Erica. <clears throat> Werther is one of my old classic favorites. It was a leading role for a mezzo. It took place at Christmas, which also allowed something that we didn't see in opera very often, which we have a lot of Christmas carols. We had a lot of involvement from the children's chorus that was used to great advantage. Musically, it wasn't as revolutionary as I think we would all like. Yeah, it was mass and A, but it was incredibly well done and just so so gratifying to sing. I think that Verter is one of the most annoying tenor roles in all of opera. <laughs> I hate him. I think Massenet's music is universally beautiful. There aren't many moments I can think of in Massenet operas that are unintentionally ugly or unpleasant to listen to. I think his music is often pretty. The main issue I tend to have with his operas is that I feel like the libretti often have a lot of fat in it that can be cut. It feels longer than necessary. But having said that, Werther might have as a whole, like my favorite operatic music of Massenet's. A lot of the music is just really ravishingly beautiful. I like parts of other things like Manon, but my ear doesn't stay as engaged in other Massenet works that I've heard as it does in this one. You're like totally right about that. And I didn't even think about it, but the reason Werther sort of drags on a bit for lack of a better phrase is, is because he didn't cut the fat in a lot of areas to the story. You mentioned the children's chorus and I think it's a great way to break up some of that text monotony especially because whenever I've seen it I love the children's chorus moments. It almost functions ironically in this the way that like ballets in Baroque French operas functioned as like a sort of intermezzo or you know like a, a break in the pacing. I don't know if that was his intention, but I love those moments in this in this piece. I mean, tell everybody what you do for a living. I teach elementary music. For the record. Thank you. 
Let I'll, the record show that Ramin teaches elementary school music. But also, I, I do prefer <laughs> the children's chorus in Verter to the children's chorus in another Christmas time opera. La Boheme. In, <laughs> children's chorus in Boheme, cut it. Please cut it. <laughs> I, actually, I actually like that one better because I think it serves the scene setting better than the one in Verter, I think. No, that one's obnoxious. It's obnoxious. Even if you're an elementary not, music I'm not saying it's not obnoxious. I, but if I was an elementary school music teacher, maybe I would appreciate it more. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> I don't remember which composer it was. I think it's Strauss, Richard Strauss, who said of cutting the fat in an opera. I think it was Rosenkav. Some production that someone had seen of Rosenkav that Strauss himself was not involved in, and someone wrote to Strauss and said, this felt interminably long, and it normally doesn't. What was different? And Strauss went, then went to see it. It's like, they actually cut more from Rosenkav than people usually cut, and that messed up the pacing, which made it feel long. That's <laughs> fascinating, because Rosenkav, when it's done right, it's it's a four-hour opera that feels like a two-and-a-half-hour opera. Yeah. But most of the best moments of Rosenkav are the slow moments. Mm -hmm. And if you cut all the moments that are not as good, you're, and you end up with only slow. Yes, <laughs> because it goes back to what I was saying earlier about Rosenkav. The absurdity is what makes those more poignant moments feel that much more intense. Yeah. And so if you don't have Baron Ox chasing Octavian dressed as a woman <laughs> around the stage, it's not as exciting at the end when the Marshallin gives Octavian over to Sophie. Okay, so now let's go to another Christmas themed thing. Boy, it was a whole Christmas moment. So the Nutcracker is what got me into classical music. Aww. And I was, uh, I don't know, somewhere between seven to 10 years old, something like that, six to 10. My family got me for Christmas one year, a cassette of the Nutcracker. And it wasn't even the whole ballet. I'm pretty sure it was just a highlight. But the first time they played it in the car for me, like something activated in me and I became obsessed. I demanded that they play it whenever we were in the car together for like, two months or something that probably colors my opinion of it in adulthood but i do think this is a classic for a reason i yes. think tchaikovsky's music works better for ballet than for opera in general because at least ballet in this era is so much about showing off the dancers that if the music is too unexpected, it can sort of jar you out of the experience of watching the dancers do these amazing feats. I just think his music marries so well to the story. I do also think there is some racism in this piece, for sure. Uh, I think there are some problematic cases of exoticism. It's really hard for me to throw the baby out with the bathwater on this one because I love this piece. It's one of the few pieces that I could listen to endlessly and I wouldn't get sick of it. I have this thought all the time, especially with opera, when there's exoticism in opera, which there is a ton, or when there are really horrible misogynist moments in opera, why don't you just excerpt the parts that are not that and do them in concert instead. We don't need to do the entire opera all the time. We don't need to listen to the entire ballet all the time or watch the entire ballet. Although I guess watching a ballet is a little bit different than listening to it in concert. You can um, also stage it in a less sort of, again, yeah. like in a way that doesn't like Example. lead into the exoticism, yeah. But also talking about the Nutcracker, when we talked about the movie, An American Tale of Five All Goes West, <laughs> I talked about how Dreams to Dream was a foundational song on the kind of compositional vocabulary I used. The Waltz of the Flowers is another yes. one. I love the Waltz of, that's like one of my favorite moments in the whole Nutcracker. Yeah, yeah. but that the neighboring diminished chord that happens, ba, 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 da, that second chord is a neighboring diminished yeah. chord. It's not tonally functional at all. It's just a pretty sound that's decorating the one chord. And it's it's such a great sound, and that was hugely influential to me. See, this is me as an opera singer. I just love the Waltz of the Flowers because of the way it gets so big, <laughs> like at the end when it starts to like pick up momentum. But actually, my favorite moments of the Nutcracker, because I'm such a fucking hipster, are like the deep cuts. I love the pas de deux, which I think is not in the suite. You know, when it's like, bum 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 bum, cymbal crash, <laughs> bum 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 bum, cymbal crash. I love that i live for that moment and and when you see it staged with the choreography it is so beautiful <laughs> fun fact about the pas de deux and actually this part i like better than what you just described although i like that part too i like all of it it's, 
it's the it's the freaking nutcracker but um the opening motif melody line the yes is yeah he wrote because a friend or something dared him to write a, a piece based just on a scale yeah and that's something i love about the pas de deux is even though it's so simple like it, when you when you really boil down the theory of the music it's really basic but it's yeah. just so well orchestrated well, and i think that's what tchaikovsky does really well is he does that really broad you know, I think the word is overused, but sweeping orchestration, like so well in all my favorite moments of the Nutcracker and of, from his operas like Yolanta and Evgeny Onegin are the moments that do that, where it's just like music washing over you, <laughs> you know? I love that so much. I'm such a fucking nerd. <laughs> we also didn't talk about the Sugar Plum Fairy and how oh, that is why, and that's why we all know what a Celesta is. The Celesta was like a new instrument, right? The version that Tchaikovsky used was the 1886 version so it's like six so it was old. like the new improved Chilesta yeah does anybody else have a favorite retelling of the Nutcracker story like a movie or TV show that took the story and redid it see I was going to talk about the Care Bears Nutcracker but... <laughs> I've never heard of that. I didn't know it was a thing. It was cheesy, but it was very Care Bears and it was beautifully done. There is a hip hop nutcracker that was done like a year or two ago, I think. And um, I've seen parts of it, haven't seen the whole thing. I enjoyed the parts I saw. So believe it or not, y'all, April Fools! <laughs> <laughs> 1892. I put my head exactly in the <laughs> Wow, Molly, I don't, I don't laugh at your opinions. Well, yeah, thanks so much, everyone, for watching. Got you, haha, <laughs> punked. Join us for more 1992 stuff coming soon. Thanks for watching, everybody. Give this video a like if you liked it. Give it a pity like if you didn't like it. If you have any comments on music from 1892, leave them in the comments below. I'd love I, to read them. I genuinely like to read yeah. people's comments <laughs> on the music from 1892. Yeah, you're looking the wrong way, Molly. Oh. <laughs> to This Side of Erica is a video that YouTube thinks you might like, so check that out. Up there, you can go to our channel where you'll see that we do commentary and reviews of media, mostly video games and music, but some other stuff occasionally here and there. That's about it. Maintain your groovy selves. Maintain your groovy selves. Bye -bye. <laughs>